This home is at the center of a spine-tingling mystery. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the things Netflix's The Watcher got factually right and wrong. It might not frighten you yet, but it will. What else didn't they tell you? For this list, we're looking at what's fact and what's fiction in the Netflix thriller about a nightmarish house purchase. Warning, spoilers ahead. Are you watching The Watcher? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. The family actually lived in the house. Wrong. Dean and Nora Branick, the fictionalized counterparts of real couple Derek and Maria Bratis, go to the open house of a massive home in affluent Westfield, New Jersey. Soon, they're moving in and starting renovations. Carrera Marbles, so 2009, and oh. you know when I'm, I'm making my special pasta oh, on yeah. Sunday with the red wine. I don't want to have to worry about it staying in the marble. In June 2014, the Broadduses purchased a Dutch colonial for $1.35 million, a house and price both significantly smaller than what's portrayed in the series. Just days after closing, Derek found the menacing watcher letter in the mailbox. Asking, why are you here? I will find out. And also referencing young blood, stating, once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. He and Maria were too freaked out to move in, which means they didn't have any scary home invasion situations or slain pets. And while teenage Ellie Brannock finds the first letter in the series, the real-life Broadduses kept the letters a secret from their three much younger children. Okay, let's get going. I'm gonna be late for school. Come on, guys, let's go. Number nine, creepy neighbors. Right. Sort of. Before the Brannocks even purchase the house, they meet two of their very strange neighbors, siblings Jasper and Pearl Winslow. What was he? Was he in the dumb waiter? Yeah. Well, my thousand apologies. The last owners let him do that. While these two are completely fictional characters, they're likely based on Abby and Michael Langford, who were top suspects in the real case. Michael Langford, diagnosed with schizophrenia, was known in the neighborhood for odd but harmless behavior, similar to Jasper. Yeah, he's a good guy. He brought me my mail. He was always sweet with my son. He's a good guy. One of the painters working at the Broaddus' house also reported seeing a couple sitting in lawn chairs facing the house. This sounds like the inspiration behind the Brannock's hostile neighbors Mitch and Moe. Whether they wore matching tracksuits is unknown, but the blood cult was made up just for the series. Luckily, it doesn't seem the real-life neighbors ever harassed the Broadduses either. We are doing what we've done for the past 20 years, which is getting in our vitamin D and harvesting the wild arugula that grows along the fence. <laughs> Number 8. Dean wrote a watcher letter. Right. In the series, Dean's obsession with catching the watcher spirals out of control. It's affecting his marriage, his job, his relationship with his kids, and his overall mental health. I'm gonna figure out who did this to us, okay? I accept that now. You should do the same. I am gonna figure out who ruined this family. It's you! You're the one who's ruining this family by not letting go! In episode 5, he confesses to Nora that he wrote the third letter to make her want to sell the house. Later, he also sends letters to people in the neighborhood to get back at everyone. You're just making everything so much worse. What, they don't deserve it? A little taste of their own medicine? Derek Broaddus also admitted to sending anonymous letters to his former neighbors in a 2018 New York Magazine article, which were signed Friends of the Broaddus Family. Like Dean, he was hard-pressed after they were accused of pulling off an elaborate scheme. Though for his family, this went on for years. Derek claims those letters were the only anonymous letters he's ever sent and were the result of years of frustration at his family's plight and the neighborhood's seeming ambivalence. Number 7. The Westfield Preservation Society. Wrong. As the head of the Westfield Preservation Society, Pearl Winslow has a strong desire to protect the interior and exterior of 657 Boulevard. This dumbwaiter, you know, it's, it's a national treasure. I'm, I'm the president of the local preservation society. We, we have had 14 meetings about this dumbwaiter alone. She vocalizes her disdain for the renovations and the threats to rip out the 100-year-old trees. The Westfield Preservation Society doesn't actually exist. However, another organization made the Broaddus' lives much harder. My theory is I think it's probably a developer that really likes the land. You know, he's going to tear down the house and salt the earth and then rebuild. Karen, no one's buying this house just to tear it down. Nor I seriously think you should consider it. In January 2017, the Westfield Planning Board had a three-hour meeting to decide if the Broadduses should be able to sell the house to a developer who would divide the property and build two homes in its place. 
The people of Westfield had a very pearl-like reaction to the possibility of the home being demolished, and the board ultimately rejected the proposal. I see. That's what you think of American history. Just complete disregard. Number six, the Broadduses moved to the city. Wrong. We need to get out of here permanently. For the sake of the kids, the sake of our family. Okay? We need to sell this house. I agree. When the Braddocks decide to leave 657 Boulevard for good, they return to their old home in New York City. Derek and Maria Broaddus, however, opted to stay in Westfield, which is where Maria grew up. Despite never living in the house, they still had to pay a mortgage and property taxes, totaling around $100,000. All of this, you should have it. And you know why? Because you're rich. Yeah. See, we're, we're not rich, though, if I'm being honest. Even so, the Broadduses found a smaller house in the area. And taking a page out of Karen Calhoun's book, the couple bought it using an LLC to keep their information private. They still had trouble selling the house given its reputation and had to repeatedly lower the asking price. Renters occupied the house until 2019, when the Broadduses were finally able to sell it. Now they've bought a new home and they hope this one brings them peace of mind, but what an ordeal. Number five, hiring a private investigator. Right. In episode two, Dean meets with Theodora Birch, a former jazz singer and current private investigator. 122 cases. I've solved 93. I'm a regular goddamn murder, she wrote. Once she's hired, she gets to work looking into their weirdo neighbors and manages to uncover quite a bit throughout the series. The Broadduses also hired a private investigator when they started their own investigation, along with multiple experts like handwriting analysts and former FBI agents. They took extra security measures installing a new alarm system and later put in cameras around the property for the renters. Probably 10. Three in front, two on each side, and then another three in the back. Something like that. Right. That may be overkill. No, no, that's okay. Over overkill's good. However, there wasn't a young security business owner hanging around and no secret teenage romance happening. So, uh, where are you off to? Don't get any ideas. Number four. Secret tunnels and hidden rooms. Wrong. Episode five ends with a construction worker showing Dean and Nora a tunnel the crew found in the basement. These are actually pretty common in the Northeast with houses this old. They used them to run booze during Prohibition. Desperate for answers, the couple head into the tunnel without hesitation and come across a secret room that looks lived in. They see someone fleeing, but aren't able to catch them. There's a cot down there, there's even food. So whoever this is, Clearly, they've been sleeping down there. It is a scary discovery. And thankfully, Derek and Maria Broaddus didn't have this experience. The second Watcher letter ominously mentioned the basement, asking, quote, Will the young blood play in the basement, or are they too afraid to go down there alone? Uh, hey, well, hold on. I'm coming with you. You're going to want a hard hat. Number three, an English teacher was a suspect. Right. Someone's writing strange letters about a house and calling themselves the Watcher. <laughs> it's definitely Roger. Theodora learns that Westfield resident and retired local teacher Roger Kaplan has been obsessed with 657 Boulevard since he was a kid. Not only that, for years, he's instructed students to write love letters to houses as a homework assignment called an ode to a house. What was the assignment? Well, they were supposed to find a house that they all loved and I guess spend time studying it or something. <sighs> then they write a letter to it, like a love letter. Kaplan is based on real English teacher, author, and potential suspect Roger Kaplow, who reportedly told his students about a house in Westfield that he always loved, and according to one account, had written over 50 love letters to. However, Kaplow claimed that this was true, but that the house wasn't 657 Boulevard, but a Victorian on the north side of Westfield. Oddly enough, Richard Kaplow, Robert's brother, lived less than a block away from 657 Boulevard. I'll be right here. That's right. Your house knows me, your house likes me, your house wishes that I was living in it instead of you. Number two, a family was murdered in the house. Wrong. In episode three, Theodora tells Dean about a family who previously lived at 657 Boulevard. It's also where they tragically died at the hands of family patriarch John Graff. Do what the house asks of you, and you know they will go to a better place. I will watch them from there, John. While there wasn't an actual mass murder at the house, 
Graf is inspired by real-life Westfield resident John List, who methodically killed his mother, wife, and three children on November 9, 1971. Like the fictional Graf, List was fired from an accounting firm not long before he planned to murder his family, believing he was saving them from an evil world. Apparently, he saw fit to not answer my prayers the way I hoped they would be answered. This made me think that perhaps it was for the best as far as the children's souls were concerned. However, unlike Graf, List left Westfield and started a new life in Denver, Colorado. It was 18 years before he was apprehended. He died in 2008 while serving five consecutive life sentences. You get a sense of no remorse. You don't sense an angry, evil man. You simply sense a man without a moral compass and devoid of all empathy for his actions. Before we unveil our top pick, here are some honorable mentions. Previous owners also received letters. Right, John and Andrea Woods got one letter before closing, but were never harassed. This is just like the letters we've been getting. I mean, it's the same writing style, same typeface, even the same paper stock. Mansion by the Lake? Wrong. The real 657 Boulevard isn't as grand as the series substitute. Oh my God, it's even nicer than the photos. I told you. It's stunning. The Watcher gamer name. Right, someone nearby playing as a Watcher video game character was briefly considered a suspect. You didn't have anything to do with any letters sent to the Brannocks? No. I mean, I know of them because he told me. Uh, that's why I was helping with the security system. And the screen name? The Watcher is my son's nickname. I gave it to him when he was working as a security guard at night. Their real estate agent was an old friend. Wrong. The colorful character Karen Calhoun is a work of fiction. Ooh, wow, this is so curated. Wow, nice. Thank you. So me, you know? Wow. Single girl taking care of herself. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, the case is still unsolved. Right, the series is seemingly set in present day, with the Brannock family being terrorized by the Watcher for months. Derek and Maria Broadus have actually dealt with the nightmare since June 2014, and though they're technically free of 657 Boulevard, there are still many unanswered questions. I can't let it go. I can't just get over it. I feel like somebody played a big practical joke on us and I'm never going to know why they did it. Like in the series, DNA from the envelope was determined to be from a woman. Abby Langford and Maria Broadus gave DNA samples and neither were a match. The previous owner, Andrea Woods, was also ruled out. People, especially online sleuths, continue to theorize and look for clues. And with the Netflix series, there's already renewed interest. She said she wanted to give you two some peace. I think she wanted peace too. As of October 2022, the new owners of the house have not reported receiving any letters. The true identity of the Watcher remains unknown. The Watcher has never been identified. The final letter declared, the Watcher won. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.